Howdy gamers, and there's three things I love more than everything else. Top 10s, video games, and years. That's why today I'm going to be taking a look at all the Hallmark Christmas movies and ranking them from best to worst. Wait a minute. It's that time of year again, also known as the end. It's fun to look back and reflect on the experiences you've had throughout the year, how we've gotten better and worse as a person. I've certainly done my fair share of both. I applied to colleges, joined the working class, but I started buying vinyls of video game soundtracks that are readily available on YouTube for substantially less, otherwise known as free. Of course, with everything I had going on this year, I was definitely a lot busier, which left a lot less time for playing video games. In total, I beat 41, which was less than last year, and unfortunately as a result of that, I didn't even beat any games I'd consider a masterpiece. Don't get me wrong. I still beat a lot of games, especially when compared to a fetus, but I guess that's just what happens when you go back to school in person and join the working class. Something they don't teach you in school is that having a job severely limits how many hours you can put into Yoshi's Cookie. But with that does come more disposable income. Before, I was doing yard work for my grandparents and bought worthless garbage that way. But this year, since I was earning more, I could buy more worthless garbage with the occasional new release. So instead of skipping buying Monster Hunter Guys at launch, I... Wait, no, I, I did skip buying Monster Hunter Rise at launch, but I did pick up Mario Golf Super Rush Day 1, which I'm not sure what that says about me as a person, but I'm sure it's not good. However, I still stand by what I said last year about it not being worth picking up new games at launch, since they only get cheaper over time, and there are so many better older games that are dirt cheap, like Pole Position for the Atari. Okay, maybe not pole position for the Atari, but Enter the Gungeon's pretty neat. It came out in 2016, which as you'll soon see is pretty brand new as far as I'm concerned. I ended up getting it three years later for Christmas though, and I've been playing it on and off since. It was a fun pick up and play game to have on the Switch, so I always had something to do between the OJ Simpson trial rewatches. Honestly, as someone who's only ever beaten two other roguelikes, one being on the literal Game Boy and the other one being not Hades, it's my favorite of the genre, and for so many reasons. The guns are the most unique out of any video game I've ever played, and that's saying something, because there are 243 of them. Whether it's Samus's arm cannon, a literal dart gun, or a bullet that shoots out guns that then shoot out bullets, you're in for a treat whenever you find a chest. The same can be said about the items, and finding out what they and each of the guns do was such a treat. Apart from those, there's even more to discover, like the elevator or glitch chest, making it so even when I was over 100 hours in, I was still discovering new things. Oh shoot, I can press A to start? As for the randomization of the floor layouts in the game, I'd say it was done pretty well. There were only a few rooms that stood out to me and would make me go, oh I remember seeing this one, which says a lot not only about my observation skill slash memory, but also the amount of possible rooms per floor. Finally, the bosses in this game are done phenomenally. The pixel art for them, as well as the rest of the game, is beautiful. The attack patterns are well choreographed, they're all unique from the last with multiple possible bosses per floor, and there is a nice difficulty curve for them as the game continues. The rest of the enemies the game has to offer are just as amazing with new ones per floor, adding to the well done difficulty curve. But if roguelikes aren't your style, then maybe you like tactical RPGs with my favorite of all time being Fire Emblem Awakening. In all honesty, it's the only one I've ever beaten, but it was fun from start to finish. The story, well not the craziest out there, was still very entertaining and the characters within it were even better. Getting attached and learning more about them only to see them die off in combat because I apparently have terrible spatial awareness made the game so memorable. Conversely, there were so many moments where I thought someone would die only for them to somehow clutch it that led to me genuinely gasping once or twice. Of course, that was only possible due to the amazing battle system and maps featured in the game. Fighting on a new map for the first time was always a great feeling, and each character having their own strengths and weaknesses you need to look out for while playing wasn't at all as difficult as I thought it would be with permanent death. With good base movement and the aforementioned permanent death, a lot of people like to compare it to chess, but I don't think that's the best comparison since permanent death can be turned off, it's easy to learn, there are multiple maps, and I don't hear many chess fans talking about wanting to have sex with the pawn. But if you don't own a 3DS, you could always try a short hike. I mean that both literally because going outside is important, but also the video game because I don't think I've ever played a game this peaceful. You're a young bird who's staying at Hawk Peak Provincial Park and is expecting an important call. Unfortunately, there's no cell phone service, so you need to climb to the top so you can accept it. But none of that really matters. The plot isn't meant to be complex, because it's about the journey and not the destination. 
You'll meet so many pleasant characters on your way up, all while you're exploring the park and collecting feathers which allow you to progress. You get them all in different ways, whether it's finding them, playing volleyball, or helping someone out. The progression of the game feels very natural since the feathers just give you an extra jump, so it's not like there's ever some wall demanding you get X amount of feathers to continue. If you're skilled enough, you could beat the game with only one or two, but realistically you won't want to. The world is fun to explore and the feathers are spread out well, so it felt like I was always discovering something. The best way to describe it is like Breath of the Wild but on a much smaller scale, and without a warning that says the game causes cancer. Anyways, even though a short hike is by no means my favorite I'm talking about, if I was to recommend only one game, it might be this one. It's around an hour long, appeals to a broad audience, and is only $8. Ironically, the next game is Final Fantasy X, which is sort of the exact opposite. It's extremely long, appeals to the type of person who buys an Isabelle amiibo for all the wrong reasons, and has one of my favorite stories in a video game ever. I know a game like that can be daunting to get into, and the game definitely takes its time getting started, at least that's how I felt, but once I left Luca, I realized this was going to be one of my favorite games of all time. The chemistry between the characters is amazing. You really do get attached to them as the story goes on, and I loved seeing how they progressed as characters. Getting to learn more about them in the world of Spira was such an enjoyable experience. The game even made me tear up once or twice while playing, and I feel like this is a game that will stick with me for a while. Of course, it's also an RPG, and I like that aspect of it as well. In battle, everyone has their own strengths and weaknesses, so learning when to use each character was rewarding, and some of the bosses took genuine strategy and planning to beat. To make all that better, there's the Sphere Grid, which was admittedly overwhelming at first, appearing more complicated than most of the classes I've taken in high school, but the more I played, the more I enjoyed it. Instead of your typical skill tree, everyone is on a sphere grid that by doing battles and leveling up characters you can progress further on. However, instead of a character being restricted to only their skill tree, they can branch out allowing anyone to learn any technique. Sure, they might not be as good at it as someone of that specific class, but it was still sick and makes each playthrough slightly unique. In spite of that and all the enjoyment I got from it, I would be lying if I said it was my favorite combat system in an RPG ever because that honor has to go to the World Ends With You Final Remix. My favorite part about this game is mentioning that it's technically a $50 port of a $15 mobile game, with the combat being a close second. You might have actually heard that the controls for Final Remix are bad, and that's not entirely true. The original game launched on the DS and was played almost entirely through touch, including the combat. Obviously, that's hard to do on not a touchscreen, so because many reviewers needed to play the game in docked mode so that they could capture footage, there became some sort of misconception that the Switch port botched the controls in some way or another. When playing in handheld mode though, this couldn't be further from the truth. It mostly retains the original playstyle, so the game just gives more options, and at that point complaining about the controls is like picking the French text option for Breath of the Wild and getting mad you can't read anything. But back to the combat. You attack enemies by doing a combination of swipes, taps, and drags that differ depending on what pins you have equipped. They all have a cooldown though, encouraging you to do combos, rotating your attacks, and using your partner to fill up the special meter. If you're good enough, you can even go through an entire fight without being hit, because if you swipe your character, you can dodge which feels good to pull off. Unlike some RPGs, I was happy whenever an encounter happened, and thankfully they aren't even random. You have to choose whenever you want to engage in combat, although the game does require it throughout the game in order to progress. Additionally, progression can come from the form of environmental puzzles, and although they were all extremely easy to the point where calling them puzzles might not be the best word, they kept the game from getting repetitive. But this is also an RPG, so there's expectedly a story that ties it all together. Once again, this is one of my favorite stories ever told in a video game. There are so many twists and turns, with the story being made even better by some amazing characters. The protagonist, Naku, admittedly starts off not the best, but that's done intentionally because through character progression, he became one of my favorite characters in a video game. Pretty much all the people in the game progress as the story goes on, even some side ones you wouldn't expect to. But if all that wasn't enough, this game is just oozing charm and style. From the music, the character and world designs, even just the way the menus are, it's all extremely unique as well as memorable for a video game. If all that sounds good, but you're put off by the length of some RPGs because they can be the length of over 100 colonoscopies, don't worry because the world ends with you is short. I'm not going to say the exact length because that feels spoilery, which might sound weird, but you'll understand once you play. 
However, if you're looking for a short game that you can know the length of going in, I really recommend Bowser's Fury. Oh hey look, we're 6 games in and I finally got to one that came out this year. One could argue it doesn't even count because it's only included in the Super Mario 3D World port as a bonus, and since it can't be purchased separately, it's clearly not its own game. But to that I would just question why someone would care so much about an end of the year list. Like it's January, taxes are due in April, do that or something. I feel like it counts, since it's completely independent of 3D World and structure, it's on its own on the menu, and I just really want to feel like I played more games that came out in 2021 than I actually did. Not to mention the game is fun so naturally I wanted to talk about it. But I feel like saying it's fun might be an understatement. This is the first 3D Mario game that to me has actually felt like an open world. Super Mario Odyssey was definitely an open world game, there's no denying that, but there's something so cool about having an entire Mario game take place all on one interconnected map, getting to travel naturally between the different landmarks. Furthermore, it's super quick to get around like Lapcat, so there was not a single moment that I was wishing everything was connected through a level select screen. You might think that the game being connected would be a hindrance to the possible variety of the game, but that couldn't be further from the truth. All the different islands managed to have their own unique theme from a lava island, ice island, and even an invisible island. There also wasn't a single place that I felt was significantly worse than the others. They were all loads of fun to complete, and the best part was, Whenever you came back to an old island, there was always something new to do. I hardly ever 100% games, but on the first day the game came out, I was having so much fun I couldn't help myself. Even if you didn't like Super Mario 3D World, I'm pretty sure that you would get some fun out of this. Maybe at that point it wouldn't be worth spending $60 for a 3-5 hour game, but if you've yet to play Super Mario 3D World, or just want to play it again, Please don't overlook Bowser's Fury. Also don't be scared off by me mentioning a game that was released in 2021 because I'm right back to talking about video games older than me. Metroid Zero Mission is a 17 year old remake of a 35 year old NES game and is still better than a lot of Metroidvanias coming out nowadays. The game has no fluff whatsoever, you're always exploring new areas, finding new power ups, or going back through areas with an expanded arsenal of upgrades that make it fun to backtrack. It's definitely a lot more linear than something like Hollow Knight, with the game pretty much always showing you where to go on the map with a marker. This meant I never got lost while playing, which is a good thing for most people, but personally was a bit disappointing as getting lost only to find out where to go next is always satisfying for me at least. I can't say too much on how faithful this game is as a remake, because like most NES games released early on, the best compliment I can give it is that it's playable, so I never got far in the original Metroid to say anything on that front. But even disregarding it as a remake, it's an amazing game, and if you're into Metroidvanias, you owe it to yourself to check this game out. Or you can just play the game with the funny plant guys. Pikmin 3 Deluxe. The small guys make funny noises, and it makes me smile. What else is there to say? Actually, probably a lot, because if you're like me when I was first going into Pikmin 3 Deluxe, the only thing you know about the series is that 7 years ago Miyamoto said Pikmin 4 was nearing the final stages of development, which doesn't say a lot about the gameplay, only that these games must take a while to create. After beating Pikmin 3, it sort of makes sense considering how much love and care is put into the environment. Here there are 5 of them which might not seem like a lot, but they're all massive and take multiple in-game days to traverse around. Each one is unique in its theme and there's so much to do in each one, but it never feels overwhelming or repetitive. The main goal of the game is to repair the ship, but you've also lost all your food supply so you'll need to find more if you want to survive. At first I was worried the constant looming fail state would be stressful, but it wasn't at all. It was especially hard to be stressed when everything else was just so lovely. The puzzles in the environment you have to solve to get the items are really creative and will involve you switching between different types of Pikmin. Plus, the game is sure to introduce new types at the perfect time to keep the game from feeling stale. They all have their own special abilities from being able to fly to resisting fire and the game does a great job at teaching you what each one is capable of. If you've played Pikmin 1 and 2, you don't even have to worry about the game feeling the same because new types are introduced along with an updated companion system. In Pikmin 2, you could switch between Olimar and Nui to maximize efficiency, but now even when you're not actively playing as whatever second character there is, you can command them to go to a certain place, allowing you to always be doing what you need to be. If that does seem too complicated, you don't even have to do it. It's only there for those looking for a more efficient run, which although I've never played the game again, 
I am tempted to do so. Just like with the next game, Metroid Dread. That's right, I've got a real full game that I released in 2021 on this list, just to prove how cool I am. I believe that's what some people would call character development. In all honesty, I originally wasn't planning on pre-ordering Metroid Dread, but I managed to get the collector's edition before it sold out, and I couldn't be happier that I got it. Not only because it's a cool piece to have, but also because I went on to beat the game the same weekend that I got it. To be fair, the game is only around 7-9 to nine hours, but whenever I started playing the game, I had trouble putting it back down. Just like with Zero Mission, I don't think I ever got lost, but in that game they had markers showing you where to go, so it's kinda hard to get lost, but here, the world design is just so excellent at guiding you where to go next that you're always discovering new areas and power-ups. Speaking of power-ups, there are some here that I've just never seen in a Metroidvania before, which I was pleasantly surprised by. They all have their own uses, and some go beyond being used to solve puzzles and go on to become important parts of your moveset that you'll not only use in battle, but to traverse around the world faster. All of the new movement options this game adds feel so natural like Samus always should have had them, making some older games like Samus Returns feel almost sluggish in comparison. It makes backtracking a lot more fun. Not even that you do too much of it in this game unless you want to look for extras. Although, I wouldn't blame you if you want to backtrack just to see the background environs because they're gorgeous. In Samus Returns, they weren't the best. The only one I can even remember is when they had the cube from Fortnite for whatever reason, and they always seem so gamey, but here, they look like they just continue on for miles and they give context to the areas you're standing on so they might look like floating video game platforms at first, but you'll soon realize the actual in-game context of them. There is even one point where a boss can first be seen in the background and then you go up against them later. It's more than just the environments that look good though, Samus looks the best she ever has and the areas as a whole just look breathtaking at times. Personally, I feel like this game had the most unique areas in a Metroid game, each one standing out a lot more than the sections did in other games. All of that is not even to mention the main gimmick of Metroid Dread, the Emmys. Just holy frick, these are cool! Each Emmy is contained in their respective Emmy zone, which is nice because it allows for the rest of the game to progress naturally, but then when you see that black and white door, you hesitate a bit. Not because the rooms are boring though, because it can be tense going through them with the maze-like design of the areas. The map designers made sure to put enough tools in place to make getting around them easy, but conversely enough obstacles that when you get seen, it's not just an easy escape. The game even upgrades the enemies as the game progresses, which some found annoying, but I liked because otherwise I feel like they would have been too easy in the late game. Finally, the bosses in this game were the best the Metroid series has to offer. A few of them are genuinely tough, and although some mini bosses get repeated in the late game, I didn't mind at all. It was only a few times and the design of the fight was fun enough that it was enjoyable to me. Like, I hated the repeated Metroid fights from Samus Returns, but the way these were done was a lot better. Overall, Metroid Dread might not be on the same level as Super Metroid or Hollow Knight, but it's remarkably close. Anyways, remember that throwaway thing I said at the beginning of all this about how I wouldn't consider any of the games I beat this year to be a masterpiece? Yeah, that was a lie. One of my New Year's resolutions is to spread as much misinformation as possible. I also said it so when I revealed my number one game this year, Hotel Dusk Room 215 to be a masterpiece, it would hit a lot harder. Although it probably doesn't work since no one knows what a Hotel Dusk or a Room 215 is. That's a shame though, because more people need to play this game. I mean, not too many because as far as DS games go, it's relatively cheap, so how about we just keep this between you and I? The game is a point and click visual novel, and if you're like me, you've already lost interest since those are probably two of my least favorite genres, but somehow, this game makes it work. A big part of why it works is because the story this game has to tell is without a doubt my favorite in any video game ever. The mystery presented throughout is so masterfully done because you're slowly learning more and more but never too much that you immediately know what's going on. It's a perfect build up that I imagine makes replaying the game and seeing all the pieces fall into place really fun. Of course, part of what makes the story so amazing is the memorable cast of characters you meet throughout. They all have their own stories and secrets that might seem unrelated to the main plot at first, but as everything progresses you soon realize how it all connects and it's genius. These smaller stories are just as well written as the main narrative, 
However, it's hard to say much more without spoiling anything, so just know that the story is worth playing for on its own. Howbeit, that's just the visual novel side of things. The point and click aspect, well it's not as good, but it's still amazing. From my experience, a lot of point and click games have more bad puzzles than good. If you're lucky, maybe you'll find something like Day of the Tentacle where one fourth of the puzzles are good. Fortunately, that couldn't be further from how Hotel Dusk works. I'd say there are only one or two bad puzzles, and just calling them puzzles feels weird. I mean, yes, one of them literally is a puzzle, but even including that one, they're all well integrated into the game and narrative. Additionally, they give you the feeling of being a genius for solving them, and as an added bonus, they really take advantage of the fact that it's on a DS. They'll have you using the touchpad and some other functions in creative ways that manage to not come across as gimmicky, but instead like Sing was using the DS's potential to their fullest. Of course, there's no talking about Hotel Dusk Room 215 without mentioning the fact that you can draw penises in the notebook, which is pretty funny I think. But also the art style. There aren't many DS games that tackle a full-on 3D environment with an attempt at realism, but Hotel Dusk's go at it is charming. The low poly nature of it really added to the calming atmosphere of the hotel, making me wish more DS games had tried it. That's only half of the screen though, the other shows a helpful map, but when talking to someone, you get to see beautifully drawn characters animated through rotoscoping to add the cool hand sketched on a notebook vibe the game's going for. According to an unsighted quote I read on the game's Wikipedia article, so only the most trusted of sources, the game's director wanted the game to have, quote, an unprecedented visual expression not found in any other game. And for the most part, I'd say he succeeded. I mean, who knows if he really said that, but like I said, for my New Year's resolution, I'm trying to spread as much misinformation as possible, so personally, I approve. Finally, I need to talk about this game's soundtrack, because it's the icing on the already pretty freaking cool cake. I haven't taken a class on music theory, so I'm not going to be able to express this well at all, but the game's soundtrack matches the aesthetic of the game perfectly. It's very calm for the most part, fitting the hand-drawn and cozy low poly art style the game has, but the game also knows when to change up the tempo of the music to make things more sad or intense depending on the situation, perfectly matching what's happening on screen. I couldn't imagine any other songs accompanying this game. Well, those are games I beat in 2021, and 10 of them at that. If you end up playing any of them, I promise you won't regret it. And who knows, maybe later on this year, I'll go more in depth on some of them. And hey, if you play one of the games, let me know how much you enjoyed it. And if you didn't, please keep it to yourself. My ego can't handle that. Anyways, remember to stay safe and that I love you guys.